clear. Good night, good night, and good night again. It is windy in St. Philip. A wind of change. You know, I thought it was windy in St. Lucy. I used to think it was windy in St. Joseph. But I am feeling a powerful wind in this constituency. It's been an exciting week in politics. They say a week in politics is a long time, but this has been an exciting week. Last Sunday, we had a front page photograph of the current commissioner of police. This Sunday, we have a front page photograph of the last commissioner of police. We're talking about wiretapping. We're talking about all kinds of things. An exciting week. But let's begin by reminding you that Fronda Stewart has only 23 days left as an elected prime minister of this country. That old saying, time is longer than twine, you remember it? Frandell Twine is coming really close to the baller now. 23 more days. And every day of those 23 days, you can bet that the Democratic Labour Party will be doing every single thing that it can do to keep you looking in the wrong direction. They will do everything that they can do to distract you from the true political issues of the day. And the last week has been a classic example of that. They want to distract you from the constant battering that they are getting in the press. They want to distract you from the constant battering that they are getting in the polls. They want to distract you from the constant battering that they're getting in the bus stand, in the rum shops, and in the supermarkets. And they are therefore now concentrating on the politics of distraction. You see, the Democratic Labour Party can't afford for the people of this country to really talk about the kinds of things that Ryan just shared with you. I did not realize, Ryan, thank you for telling me, that I was $60,000 better off when we were last in government. I don't have it. I don't know where it went. But at least I know that I was $60,000 better off under the Bs than we are under the Ds. And that $60,000 better off that we had would have paid for our children's education. It would have helped us to put aside a little nest egg how many of you still have money left in the bank? Before David Thompson became Prime Minister, before the Democratic Labour Party took up office, Barbadians had not a lot, but we had a chance to save a few cents. But within months of this crew taking up office, did you not notice that you had to go to the bank and pick way a little bit. And I know that you are like me, because when I pick way the first time, I said, no problem, I'm going to put it back. Put it back. Ain't put it back yet. And you and I, this is an economics, Ryan. This is, I'm sure there are economic terms for this. But I chose tonight to bring back out my 2018 shirt. I like the team Jordan and the team Adrian and the team everybody and the team Wilfred. I like those. I like the I'm on board shirts. I like the team Dwight. But when I speak to you, I want to remind you that this is not now about making ourselves feel good. This is about rescuing a country because things are still dread. In fact, things are dreader than ever. So what are you going to do? You know, when we come to these meetings, I love to see all the red shirts, but I, I'm not talking to you tonight. Because those red shirts tell me which side of the fence of right-thinking Barbadians you are standing. I don't want to preach to the converted. I want to, the, to preach to the people in this constituency who perhaps in the last election either did not vote 
or voted for Adriel Braffitt, who perhaps did not vote, but voted for David Eswick or Dennis Kelman or anybody that represents the Democratic Labour Party. I want to talk to you. You see, in this constituency, we are bringing... Good night, Wilfred. Fisherman, fisherman, Wilfred. <laughs> in this constituency, we are bringing a new face. It is a second election, but it is a new face to this constituency, a man named Wilfred Abrams. And I've, I've been in this constituency, and I hear the Dems beginning to say one or two bad things about Wilfred Abrams. About in, in that way, Wilfred, don't walk across the stage again. Yeah? You're confusing my man. I beg you. And that goes for Ryan and Dwight and Adrian. Don't walk across the stage. The only body we hear once is clear. <laughs> They've begun to say some bad things about Wilfred because they said that he was in a line by votes. Last election, we had no money to buy any votes. If we did, we would be in government now. But as I told you, they, distract, they want to distract us, you see. So people are now beginning to talk about Endarweer. And I hope that the people in this constituency will get to know him as we in the Barbados Labour Party family have got to know him. We have got to know that he is a hard worker, that he's passionate about small business, that he's passionate about serving people, and passionate about improving the lives of his potential constituents. But I want to remind you that this election is not so much about Endarweer as it is about Adriel Braffitt. Endarweer does not have any seat. Endarweer does not have a seat to defend. Indarweer has not served in cabinet these last 10 years. Indarweer does not have to defend any ministerial or governmental policies. You do, Adriel Braffitt. You do, David Eswick, and you too, Michael Lashley. Indarweer is on the outside looking in like so many of you. But Adriel Braffitt is the person who is sitting in this seat and who has caused the Parliament of Barbados to waste a good mahogany chair. His stewardship, this is not about judging in that way. It is about judging Adriel Braffitt. Adriel Braffitt has the distinction of now being one of the longest serving attorneys general in this country. Do you know that he served longer than me and Motley as attorney general? He certainly served longer than me. Sir David Simmons served from 1994 until 2001. Adriel Braffitt served as attorney general from the day after David Thompson died and he continues to serve up to this day. But what does Barbados have that has had the hand of Adriel Braffitt on it that fills us with pride? An attorney general, not that all members of cabinet are not important, all members of cabinet are important, but an attorney general holds a special and important place. He is the guardian of our constitution, the supreme law of the land. He is the guardian of the rights and freedoms of Barbadians. He is the guardian of our law and order. Those are the things that the Attorney General is constitutionally bound to do. He is the chief legal advisor of the government. That is the Attorney General's role. And that is the seat that Adriel Braffitt occupies. But I want to tell you that by any measuring stick, the performance of the Attorney General of Barbados has been less than stellar. It has been way less than stellar. You could even afford to call it dismal. We expect, and I'm not talking about who Duncey or who Bright or who know the Moss Law. That's not the subject of tonight's discussion. 
what we are talking about is what is the legacy that Adriel Braffe as Attorney General has left for the people of Barbados. The Attorney General has presided over the last years over a judiciary. He has presided over a state of affairs that has seen our judicial system grinding to a halt. Now, you know, Barbadians don't like law courts. I don't even encourage them to go to the law courts. But law courts are there to dispense justice. And we have way too many cases in our law courts that have been there for five and six and 10 and 15 years. And sometimes the embarrassment is that the people who brought the cases have died. Have died. I want to share with you a few statistics. It's too windy, so I'm not going to pull out the papers. I, I'm going to rely on my memory. Between, in the last four years, between the year 20, between the years 2013 to 2016, and those are the only years that we have documented. In those years, a total of 8,122 high court cases were filed. In those same years, the High Court judges of Barbados, all eight of them, delivered 136 written decisions. Over 8,000 cases filed, but only 136 written decisions given. Only 136 matters in the civil court have been resolved. Only 136 disputes, 136 civil suits, as compared to 8,000. Now, I hope that the reason you're silent is because you're paying attention and not that I'm boring you. Then you have a situation where thousands of cases are being filed every year, but in any one year, only four or five or ten or twelve are disposed of. Sooner or later, that system will cease to function. It will be like the South Coast sewage plant. But there will be no manholes through which the sewage could escape. When Barbadians cannot find justice in the law courts, because the system is too slow, because we do not have enough judges, because of all the inefficiencies that this Democratic Labour Party has allowed to occur in the system, then people will be forced to seek their own form of justice. Um, Carol, can you tell the as the sound man if I can pull back the um, podium a little bit? Get get yourself settled. We we're not leaving. We're not leaving. So what the attorney general, the representative for this constituency, has to show is a judicial system that has grown to a halt. But neither he nor the Prime Minister chooses to say anything about it. It doesn't suit them to say anything about it. Because they not only do not know what to do about it, they have little interest in doing anything about it. But if the state of the, of the justice system in Barbados gives you concern, you are also right to be concerned about the state of affairs in the police force as presided over by Adriel Brathwaite. I'm sorry, and I, I'm not talking about you because I think the people of this constituency, when I'm done, will know what choice they have to make. This Attorney General inherited the mantra of the Democratic Labour Party that said, Policemen are going to get duty-free cars. Policemen are going to get interest-free housing loans. Do you know that within a year of them taking over government in 2008, not only did they not give anybody a duty-free car or interest-free housing loan, they cut the allowances that the police force were enjoying since David Simmons gave them to them. So the police in Barbados were not only made promises, they were actually worse off. 
We felt when we were in government that there should be nothing that the police force needed to do their job that they could not get. We increased the fleet. We gave them allowances that they didn't have before. We made sure that they had the most modern equipment. What has happened since then? Police do not even have proper uniforms to wear. But yet still, yet still, they want to make you believe that they are on board with the Royal Barbados Police Force. And the biggest scandal of all is the fact that history repeats itself. Because leading into the 2013 January election, we had the total scandal of a commissioner of police making recommendations for promotions. But the police service commission headed by one guy, Samirs, felt that the commissioner did not know what he was talking about. He, even though he's in charge of the force, shouldn't say who, he should be, who should be promoted and who should not be promoted, and caused all kind of chaos in the force, resulting in 13 lawsuits. That state of affairs completely demoralized the Royal Barbados Police Force. But this Attorney General has presided over it not just once, but twice. Because last Sunday, front page of the Daily Nation, of the Sunday Sun, we saw a report where the commissioner interviewed his senior officers and junior officers for weeks, made his recommendations for promotions to the Police Service Commission. And he came back from holiday to find that the Police Service Commission had overturned his recommendations, decided to promote other people, and all of this they did without consulting him. All of this. Repeating itself. And an attorney general sits in his office and considers this kind of political interference to be all right. I can speak for my predecessor, Mia Motley, because I saw those files, and I can speak for myself. We have never, sitting in the chair of Attorney General, gave any directions as to who should be promoted or who should not be promoted because we understood that policing is a sensitive issue. It is unfortunate that in our political system, yes, there's political interference. I, I'm not going to deny that. But I don't mind a politician interfering in National Housing Corporation to make sure that his constituent get a house. I don't mind a politician interfering with um, the National Assistance Board to make sure that one of his constituents get national assistance. I don't mind that. But I take strong exception to an attorney general and his crew interfering with the runnings of the police force because there are some things that are simply above partisan politics. Healthcare has to be above partisan politics. Our safety has to be above partisan politics. Our water supply has to be above partisan politics. But that is the Attorney General that we have. And he needs to be condemned and the people of this constituency. I call on you to reject him as a candidate in the next general election and vote for Mr. Indaweer. But this same Attorney General brought to Parliament just two weeks ago a police amendment act. And he should be ashamed to show his face because the bill has been criticized and objected to by the opposition. It has been criticized and objected to by the Bar Association. It has been criticized and objected to by members of the law faculty. It has been criticized by all, every single independent senator but they still had the gumption to push through this bill that has the potential to undermine, destroy, and eradicate all of the rights and freedoms that you and I are holding on to now as Barbadians. And he thinks that it is okay. I, you know, I, I, I'm not paranoid. But one of my constituents said to me yesterday, so Mr. Marshall, suppose under this new bill, on election morning, them cordon off Bathsheba. What if the call a curfew in Prout or in Horse Hill? How are your people going to get to the polls? Now, 
you know, we, we, I don't encourage paranoia, and this is not stuff that I, I relish talking about, but the truth is, the truth is, if up to Kaduman Day when people were getting shot down Spring Garden, the Attorney General felt that everything was groovy, he couldn't even find his phone. Couldn't find his phone. So six months ago, people getting shot up and down, but everything is all right. But four to six weeks before a general election, all of a sudden, a new piece of legislation is thrust on us without any consultation, which can see you being shut up in your house from 6 in the morning until 6 in the evening election day and not be able to vote. And the Governor General is not involved in that process because the senior police officer only has to get the consent of whom? The same Attorney General. It is no wonder, it is no wonder that the independent senators and the right-thinking members in this society have rejected this as a sensible piece of legislation. I have now begun to get afraid of the power that this government will have and can exercise in relation to how you and I not only go about our daily business, but how you or I get to the polls on election day. You know, I, I thought that the bus service was the strategy. I don't know if you thought about it, you know, but a lot of our constituents go to work first. And then around 3.30, they head to the bus stand to catch a bus and come home to go and vote. So I've been saying, well, the strategy to keep our voters home or keep our voters from voting is to make sure that they ain't going to bash the bus. To make sure that, they, you understand? I thought that that was going to be the strategy. But I'm now worried that this government could actually be so desperate and so reckless that they would think about infringing our constitutional rights all for the sake of a political victory. I am not accusing anybody, but I am here to say to you that it is possible. And with this particular group, group I worry about what they could do. But Mr. Braffitt, I, I'm in his constituency, so I have to criticize him. Mr. Braffitt said two days ago, that he is going to bring to Parliament a law making parents responsible for the crimes of their children. You know, I, I don't know. Just when you think they can get more stupid, they go and promise something like this. Now, I told you that they only have 23 more days. The next five days will be spent in the House of Assembly doing the estimates. And three days of the next week will be spent in the Senate doing the estimate. So somewhere, somewhere between the 22nd of February and the 6th of March, in that period there, he is going to bring to Parliament a law making parents responsible for their children. Now, you know, our young men and women have been fighting on school buses now and it has been put on social media day after day after day after day. And all that they could say is that they got in demons. Not a thing was done to arrest the problem, but now that a young man is holding on, is fighting for his life in the hospital, having been stabbed at Grantley Adams School, they now come up with this brilliant idea. If the children bad behave, lock up the mother and father. Then you thought they couldn't get more ridiculous. We know what it is. I'm not talking about myself, but we know what it is to have had a Sir Henry Ford in the prestigious seat of Attorney General. We know what it is to have had a Sir David Simmons. We know what it is to have had a Mia Motley. <laughs> but look where we have come to know. I don't know anything about Adriel Braffitt personally, but I know that nobody could do a worse job as Attorney General than him. 
And for that reason, in principle, the people of this constituency need to say to him, time to go. We are taking Indar on board. I spoke earlier about the politics of distraction. They don't want you to focus on the economy. So they now start to talk about wiretapping. As if wiretapping is now the biggest issue that affects our country. I have constituents who cannot and have not had a decent meal in weeks. Cynthia has constituents who have been looking for a job for years, having been sent home from the NCC, cannot find one. We all have constituents, whether they vote for us or voted against us, who are suffering under the serious blows of this Democratic Labour Party, and the Minister of Finance gets into Parliament, and instead of addressing the fundamentals of the economy, he wants to talk about wiretapping. I don't want to say very much about that. I will say this, though. I will say this, though. The methods that the Royal Barbados Police Force uses to gather intelligence on crime were always viewed by me and Mia Motley and Sir David Simmons to be sensitive and confidential issues. Because we understood the stakes, we understood what we have to lose, and we also understood the risk that police officers take on a daily basis. And so you would never have heard either me or Mia or Sir David at the worst of times discussing any of the sensitive methods used by the Royal Barbados Police Force. I am not here to tell you if there is or if there is not wiretapping, wire tapping, but what I want to say is that it is the height of irresponsibility. It is the absolute height of irresponsibility for this administration to get up and talk about things that the Royal Barbados Police Force may or may not be doing to protect you and I. But what have you noticed? In the same debate, Chris Sinclair said that there is going to be election violence. Now, again, distraction. Distraction. You see, I want to tell Chris Sinclair that I do not know what is election violence. I know what is Monday violence and Tuesday violence and violence in the bus stand, and violence in the school bus, and violence on Spring Garden on Kadumon Day. I know about violence at school fairs, maybe violence in this district. Election violence is no special violence. Violence is violence, and Chris Sinclair should do all that he can to stem it, whether it happens on election day, the day after, or the day before. But he doesn't want to talk about it in that fashion. He wants to tell you that there's something called election violence that is going to take place in this country to mar the general election. But those are scare tactics, you know. They have been in power for 10 years, and all of a sudden, these things are rearing their heads, and they're pointing to the Barbados Labour Party as being the bandits and the criminals. We won an election in 94. We outshone them in 99. And we whipped them again in 2003. There was no election violence in any of our election campaigns. We maintained the highest possible standards even when we lost. But they want to tell you now that blood will run in the gutters, according to Steve Blackett. I am now convinced that they have a plan. So this is not so much about having a fear of what 
may happen because of something that the Barbados Labour Party may do. This is a case where they have created these monsters. They have created this division in our society. They have caused a situation where now people are even beginning to feel unsafe about wearing red shirts. Now these are features of politics in other Caribbean islands, but never Barbados. So Mr. Sinclair, if you have information about potential violence on election day, I would suggest that you bring it to the police force. You see, your leader, Frondel Stewart, whenever somebody says anything to him, he says, call the police. Call the police. That is, well, that's everything now. Call the police. So, Chris Sinclair, if you have good evidence of, the, of violence on election day, call the police. And if Mr. Dennis Law has evidence of somebody buying votes, call the police. Now, you know, the problem is that the Democratic Labour Party does not intend ever to take responsibility for anything. They pass the buck. You know only too well that year after year after year, they blame the failing economy on who? The bees. Year number one is the bees' fault. First downgrade, the bees' fault. Second downgrade, the bees' fault. 23rd downgrade just came, and you know they found a way to say the bees' fault. Ten years have passed, and it is still the bees fall. Well, if it is so much the bees fall, step aside and let the bees fix the things that you say they caused. There is a lot at stake in this election. There's a lot at stake. The Barbados that exists now is not the Barbados that existed in 2008 when we lost. And Ryan, it's not just about $60,000. That is a good measurement. It's nice to know what the value of things are. But $60,000 cannot buy back the futures that were ripped from our young men and women when Frondel Schuer said, I will no longer be paying your university fees. $60,000 cannot build back the family of a constituent of mine who had to separate his family because the government refused to fix slippage. $60,000 cannot make up for the fact that individuals now who work in Bell Plain but live in Dark Hole have to leave home an extra 15 minutes earlier and therefore they have to get up an extra 15 minutes earlier and wake up the baby an extra 15 minutes earlier just to see about their business. $60,000 cannot buy the time that you lose spending with your family because you are stuck in a Fairchild Street bus stand for four hours waiting for a bus. $60,000 can't buy any of those things. Those things are priceless. There's a lot at stake and it isn't just money. And the Mia Motley team the Mia Motley team wants to restore Barbados to the place of pride, to a place where we had values, to a place where we knew what to expect from our parliamentarians. We, we knew because there was a time when parliament was a place of dignity and respect. But the Dems come into parliament with their pretty shirts and their pretty ties, and the latest clothing buttoned tightly around the belly to keep it in. But that is just a facade because they come to Parliament nicely dressed every day while they work hard on destroying our country. This is not just about $60,000 
This is about restoring the values that we had as Barbadians and making your lives whole again. And with the team that is led early by Mayor Motley, the team that I hope that in that way will be able to join and Ren and Adrian, and my friend from St. John, Charles Griffith, who I hope and pray will beat Mara Thompson. This team, this team, this red team, this magic team intends to make Barbados whole again. Good night and God bless.